know, and then you'll find First John right after that, or right before that. So again, a small book toward the end of the New Testament, and this book is in fact a letter or an epistle. And I know not many people write letters anymore, but imagine with me for just a minute. You're going through some, some old belongings in your grandmother's attic, and you come across a, a trunk full of papers and pictures and things like that. And as you look through them, you come across this four-page handwritten letter folded up and under some pictures. And you become inquisitive, and you, you want to know what the letter said. Well, what would you do? Would you pull the letter out and, and lay it, lay its pages out on the trunk? And then would you close your eyes and shuffle the papers around? And then with your eyes closed yet still, would you take your finger and drop it on one of those pages? And then would you open your eyes and find where your finger fell and read a couple lines? And then would you joyously run downstairs with with the news of what you read in those two lines and tell everybody in the family what you just learned? You're looking at me with the look I was hoping you would give me. What are you talking about? Who in their right mind would do something like that? That's silly talk, isn't it? That's, that's crazy. How are you going to understand that letter? You don't know who it's from. You don't know who it's to. You don't know when it was written. You don't know what was going on in these people, people's lives when they read it. You don't even know what part of the letter you're reading. You might be reading the very beginning, the very end. So you don't know what's going on. So you're going to have a hard time understanding it, right? Well, as silly as that little illustration sounds and is, some people still take that approach to reading the Scriptures. That, uh, that just flip the Bible open, pick a spot, stick your finger in there, and read a couple of verses and take that. Now, there may be some value in that because God's word never returns void. But how much more will we glean from God's word as we understand what we're reading? Who is from? Who is to? What's going on? When it was written? What was going on in the lives of those who were involved? What kind of, what kind of letter is it? I mean, for example, we're in 1 John. It's a letter. We may not, in another book of the Bible, it's a like Daniel, it's a narrative, for example, or, or a gospel. And these, these are different writing styles, revelation, apocalyptic literature. And so when we come to the Word of God, we've got to think about what we're reading. We don't want to go into it like we might, that crazy way that we talked about opening that letter from up in the attic. We don't want to come away from it confused with misunderstanding and taking verses out of context. So this morning, as we jump into First John, I want to make sure you know the who, what, when, where, why, and how, so to speak, of First John, that we might really glean what the Lord would have for us to glean from it. The Bible is clear, clear enough and plain enough that anyone reading it may not understand everything, but it's going to, stand every, going to understand everything they need to be saved and to live a life that honors God. There's no amount of education or extra books that is needed to understand the Bible. So don't hear me say that. But there is blessing and value in understanding the context to grant even fuller understanding to it. And so my goal is by understanding the context of the book, and all of us understanding the context of the book, that we will deepen our understanding as we study together. So today, as we introduce the letter of First John, we're going to kind of look at some overall themes that we will see within. We're going to read the first chapter together, but we're not going to work begin working verse by verse through it just yet. So if you're able, I invite you to stand with me. We're going to read this first chapter of John's first epistle together. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things 
so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word and that as we open it together that you speak as we read your word, we are reading the very word that you intend us to have as you reveal yourself to us. Through human writers, yes, but human writers that you carried along by your spirit to give us exactly what you would have us to have. And God, we pray that as we submit ourselves under, under your word, submit our ideas, our thoughts, even our desires to your word, God, that your word would then reshape our hearts, minds, longings, desires, that they would be realigned to align with yours by the power of your Holy Spirit. God bless this time together in your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we begin this book, let's begin by thinking about the genre. As I mentioned before, 1 John is a letter. And it's not in a format that we generally think of whenever we think about letters. Whenever we think about letters today, I assume they still teach how to write letters. But you've got a uh, return address up there, so you know where it's coming from. You've got the date up there, so you know when it's written. You've got dear so-and-so, so you know who it's to. You've got the body, and then at the end, you've got who it's from. Sincerely, so-and-so. So you've got, the, you've got the date. You maybe know where it's coming from with the return address. You know who it's to and who it's from. But 1 John doesn't have these features. But it is a letter. It's just not a typical letter. Not for today and even not for the time that it was written. Typical letters in Greek would have had a greeting or a salutation. It would have had a closing and which would identify the author and the original audience. Right before 1 John here is 1 Peter. If you want to look at the first couple of verses, you'll see what a typical greeting would be like in a Greek letter. It begins with Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So we have who it's from and who it's to. And that's pretty typical, but 1 John isn't like that. It doesn't have either one of those things. Without the typical opening greeting, the author's name doesn't appear in the book. But church history affirms John as the author. Additionally, there's internal and external evidence for John as the author. I'm not going to get into the, the nitty gritty of all that. But as far as internal evidence is concerned, just compare the first verses of the Gospel of John with the first few verses we read just a moment ago. John 1.1, 1, 1, the Gospel of John, begins this way. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You can see the connections already, right, with, with what is being read here or written here in 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning. We've already got this theme of beginning. We also have the themes of life and light. And just the way that it's written gives us a clear indication that this is from John. But who is John? Well, as we made our through, way through the Gospel of Mark, we learned quite a bit about the disciple John. We know that he was a disciple to begin with. But before that, um, he was a fisherman. He was actually he was fishing or fixing the nets in his boat whenever Jesus called him. He was one of the first ones to be called as a disciple of Jesus. 
And so he's, he's fishing, he's, in the, he's, he's mending nets in the boat with his brother uh, James on the Sea of Galilee. We know that they are the sons of Zebedee, given the, the, the nickname Sons of Thunder. Um, we know that John saw lots of miracles of Jesus. He was on the, the boat as the sea was stilled. As Peter walked out on water, he watched Jesus heal Peter's mother-in-law. He, he saw Jesus heal Jairus' daughter. He was one of the inner circle of Jesus' closest friends, Peter, James, and John. As such, he was with Jesus as on the Mount of Transfiguration. Maybe you remember the events of the Mount of Transfiguration. There, Jesus is with Moses and Elijah, and they're talking together. And James, Peter, and John are there taking it all in. He was there, heard the Father's declaration, this is my beloved Son, hear him, listen to him, this one with whom I am well pleased. So he was with Jesus from the beginning of his earthly ministry, one of the first ones called. He was with him all the way through his earthly ministry, and with him all the way to the Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane, excuse me, and where, where Jesus was arrested. He was with him there at the crucifixion. In fact, at the crucifixion, as Jesus hangs on the cross, Jesus tells John, care for my mom after I'm gone. John was right there through it all. And he was... He was also one of the first one, what the first one to get to the the empty tomb of the disciples. Mary, of course, was there first. Mary Magdalene, but Jesus or John was the first disciple to get to the empty tomb. He additionally, on top of that, spent time with the resurrected Jesus. Even had breakfast with he and six other disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee after Jesus had been resurrected. The same sea by which he was called as a disciple three years before. And then after the death and resurrection of Jesus, John was instrumental in the early church and the advancement of the kingdom of God in those early years of Christianity. Keep in mind also that this is the same John who wrote not only 2 John and 3 John, but also Revelation and also the Gospel of John. Now, it's impossible to pinpoint the exact date of his writings, but it seems that they were all written near the end of his life, with the Gospel of John probably written first around uh, 90 A.D., and the, the, the letters were written shortly after, and that uh, the book of Revelation was the last one to be writ written right somewhere around 95 A.D. It, we can't nail those things down exactly. But we do know that as he was writing these things, he was an old man, and... Uh, Almost certainly he was in his 80s by this time and was the only remaining apostle living. All the rest up to this point had been martyred at some point. And so 1 John is a letter. It was written by John as an octogenarian late in the first century. But let's consider now who it was written to and why. Now, while John addresses this letter to no one specifically, there are no names given, no cities in which the churches reside, it is not that this letter is simply a, a tract to be distributed to random churches. You see, as we'll see through the course of this letter, John is writing to people who he knows and loves. He calls them names like my little children that we read at the beginning of chapter 2 or beloved just a few verses later. And words like these fill the entire letter. John knows and he loves the people that he is writing to. He knows of their situation. He knows what they're going through. And he is very loving and pastoral with them while speaking frankly and directly regarding the false teachers that disrupt the churches. Now, John is, John is likely in Ephesus as he writes to these churches. And he has likely been involved. If he knows them, he's connected to these churches in one way or another. And so he's in Ephesus writing to churches in the region of Asia Minor, which he continues to watch over and, and have some influence in those churches. And this group of churches has experienced some turmoil. They've experienced the turmoil of a church split. They are experiencing, experiencing immense lack of love for one another within the church. False teaching abounds, and not only does this false teaching abound, but it divides. And there has been 
abuse and twisting of the scriptures leading to gross immorality in these churches. And so these dear people are they're shaking, shaken by the false teachers and their sin and their effects and their message. And John writes to, to bring these faithful churches assurance of their salvation, to remind them of the faith that they have held from the beginning and which it, in which they continue to stand as well. Not only that, he writes to encourage them to live lives of love, lives of holiness, and lives of joy. We see this in places like the very beginning, the fourth verse. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Joy. Or, or the first uh, verse of the second chapter. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He's concerned about the holiness of this church. The very last verse of First John is, is telling them to turn from idols. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. He's concerned about the holiness, the purity of this church. In addition, in uh, chapter 2, verse 26, it says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So very clearly, he's writing about these false teachers and these deceivers. What to do with these people in your midst and trying to divide your church. 2.21 says, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. So he's writing about assurance and confidence. It's not that they're straying from the truth, but to encourage them to hold fast to the truth in the midst of opposition and attack. In chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I wrote to you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. Again, assurance, confidence. Their faith has been shaken by these false teachers. And John writes to remind them of the truth and that their feet are firmly planted upon it. Back in Acts, Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31, Paul had issued a warning to the church concerning wolves, wolves that might come in. And he said this, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. Well, John's dealing a situa with a situation a lot like this that Paul was talking about, a situation like Paul said would come. And John rejects the teaching of these false teachers, and he affirms and reassures and encourages these faithful church members to hold fast to the truth, even in the midst of difficult times. John is dealing with a situation like Paul said would come. And in this time of false teaching, division, and heresy in the church, John's letter is a call to hold fast to the fundamentals, to get back to the basics of Christianity. And that as they return to the basics of the faith, to the core of Christianity, that they would be characterized by joy and holiness and love and confidence in their Christ. A general lesson that we must learn from this book, from the book of 1 John, is this. You ready for it? Satan hates the church. Did you hear that? It's true. Satan hates the church. The church is a lighthouse in the midst of a dark world. It is a kingdom outpost in enemy territory that is pushing back Darkness, little by little by little, if it's a healthy church. And Satan hates it. Hates the church, hates the work of the church. The prince of darkness hates the light, and there is nothing that Satan would love more than to see the church fail. Sometimes that comes through false teaching that destroys the church. Sometimes that comes through immorality that exists within the church. Sometimes that comes through division and disunity that enters the church. Sometimes it comes through unrepentant sin that lingers and festers in the church and just leads to a cancer that hinders the ministry of the church. Sometimes it comes through losing sight of who you are as a church and what you're called to be and called to do. And all of this 
was going on in the churches that John is addressing through this letter. As the church, we must recognize that we are of the primary targets of Satan. Paul's warning and the situation that John addresses is not an out there problem, but an in here problem. There will always be wolves that make their way into the flock. Those from within speaking twisted things to draw the church away from the truth and to draw away church members. As we consider our own situation and context, we are one of those kingdom outposts in our area. We are a kingdom outpost right here where God has put us. People are moving out to our area. Land is being bought up and developed and people are moving in. And we have a responsibility to be a beacon of light and a kingdom outpost that works to advance the kingdom of God right here, shining the light and pushing back the, the kingdom of darkness. But Satan would love nothing more than to ruffle some people's feathers, to plant some discontentment and some bitterness, and to derail the train and send it off the tracks crashing. And what did John do in a situation like this when the church was young and Christianity was less than 100 years old? What did John do? John's approach was to call the church back to the basics, to love one another, to hold fast to the truth. You know, I've heard it said recently, we have a book. We have a book. In other words, God has spoken and is called the Bible. Let us never wander off into our own wisdom, but hold fast to the faith once for all delivered to the saints as has been preserved in the Holy Scriptures. What one believes drives what one does. In other words, your actions will follow what you truly believe. And over the next several weeks, we'll get more, we'll get more and more into the false teaching that has affected this church and divided these churches. But for now, I'll simply say what was going on is a denial of the truth of Jesus Christ. A denial of the incarnation, a word that we spoke of this morning in our Welcome to Brookline class. A, a denial of the divinity of Jesus. In other words, they just got Jesus flat wrong. When you answer the question of who Jesus is wrong, first of all, you lose the gospel. You can't have a wrong Jesus and have a right gospel. It doesn't work that way. You got to get Jesus right. But in addition to that, your life will be out of sync. You won't be walking in the pattern of Jesus because you've got a wrong Jesus. You pattern your lives after something that's not true. And so as we'll, as we'll see throughout this series, sound faith produces obedience. And obedience issues in love. Love for God. Love for the church. Love for one another. Doctrinal compromise leads to moral decline. And it works the other way around as well. Moral decline leads to doctrinal compromise as sinners seek to justify their sin by compromising on the doctrines of our faith. Both of those things are going on in the churches to which John writes. And so maybe you're wondering, well, where does false teaching begin? How do we combat it? How do we guard against it? Again, we have a book. God has revealed himself to us in his word. You want to know how to live. You want to know what God's plan is for your life. You want to know what God desires of you. We have a book, and it is the Word of God. But the problem that we have where we wander into false teaching is that instead of, of God's revelation standing as judge over man's ideas, we elevate man's ideas and submit God's Word to man's ideas. Said another way, it's when we twist God's words to accommodate our ideas instead of submitting ideas, our ideas to God's word. It all begins with a question that is as old as the world. I say it's as old as the world because it was asked in Genesis 3, 1. When Satan is speaking to Eve and he says, did God actually say that? See, false teaching begins with a questioning of what God's word really says, and then a discounting of the truth, which the word of God makes clear. Did God actually say? Did God really say? 
There's always been and always will be until Christ returns a temptation to question God's word. A temptation to invert the the order of submission. Instead of submitting our ideas to God's word, we submit God's word to our own ideas. And this is where false teaching starts. So you're asking maybe, well, does does the modern church have the same problem that the church that John is addressing and the churches that John is addressing are, do, we, do we have that same kind of problem? Is that going on today as well? Does the modern church, modern evangelicalism, really have a false teaching problem, you might ask? Well, remember what Paul said? From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. That's not just what Paul said. It's God's word. And so it is true, and it will always be true. And so we should expect that it would be true and that the church would have a false teaching problem. I submit to you that the church does. And as such, the church needs to be reminded to hold fast to the basics that we're going to be looking at throughout the course of this book. We have a false teaching problem, and it begins with the question, did God actually say? And if we ask that question, and we already have in our minds that, that we are wanting to capitulate to being a culturally acceptable Christianity, it's a short road down there. So some examples of what we see today that exists within evangelicalism and the church at large. Did God actually say that the office of pastor is reserved for biblically qualified men? That's probably not what he meant, right? Or did God actually say that marriage is a union between one man and one woman for life? Did God really say that? Did God actually say that my gender is assigned to me at birth? Did God give me a gender that's fluid or is it assigned to me? Did God actually say that homosexuality is sinful? Or did God just say to to love whoever you want to love? We're hearing a lot about that this month. Did God actually say that I should grow in godliness as a Christian or that I can just keep doing whatever sinful activity I want because, well, God will just love me anyway. Brothers and sisters, God has clearly spoken on each of these issues, but there are some places where they're acting like he hasn't. According to Scripture, the office of pastor is reserved for biblically qualified men. Scripture. According to Scripture, marriage is between is the union between one man and one woman for life. According to Scripture, each of us was created with a gender assigned by God. According to Scripture, homosexual desires and, acti- and activity are to be rejected and resisted as any other form of sexual immorality ought to be rejected and resisted. And according to Scripture, Christians do not continue in unrepentant sin. To walk in unrepentant sin demonstrates unbelief and that one is not part of the fold of God. And as such, we cannot pursue a life of of homosexuality and call ourselves Christians any more than we can pursue a life as a serial adulterer and call ourselves Christians. Brothers and sisters, hear this phrase. Redeemed people are repentant people. It's not that they're perfect people but they grieve over their sin and they turn from it. They don't embrace their sin, but they pursue righteousness, stumbling along the way, albeit, but pursuing righteousness. And this is what John is getting at in this book. In fact, we'll see it in the very first chapter. And it was situations like these to which John was speaking, into churches where false teachers had confused and led astray and discouraged and divided churches and were still continuing to do so. And John writes to these churches, encouraging them and admonishing them because he loves them, because he cares for them, and he longs to see them walk and continue in faithfulness. And why does John love these fellow Christians so much? He loves them because God loves them so much. See, God loves his church. He does not want to see his church divided. He doesn't want to see her struggling, 
doesn't want to see his church abandoning the truth of the scriptures, the truth of the gospel. And God showed this great love, as John wrote in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves his church so much that he was willing to send his own son, his only son, to bear the sins of the church, to bear the sins of all who would believe so that we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life in him. So if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I encourage you to do so today. And for those who are already in Christ, who are already Christians, consider what John wrote in 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. See, when we consider the love of Jesus for us, we learn how we're to love others selflessly and sacrificially. That's the kind of love that our Lord has for his church. And that's the kind of love that we are to have for one another. My prayer is that the Lord will use our time in this book to ground us in that which is true, to help us recognize that which is false and to lead us into greater holiness as we pursue righteousness and forsake sin, that we may come away from 1 John with our loves refined, that we would love our Lord more fully, that we would abandon our love for the world and the things of the world, and that we would demonstrate our love for God in the way that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, your word works. You work through your word. And God, we pray that you would work even now in the hearts of each of us here. God, we confess our sins. Our sins are many. God, don't leave us there. Chastise us in our sin and bring us back to you. That we would repent of our sin, turn from it, and embrace you, our, our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you love your church. And that you have gone to great lengths to secure salvation. God, we pray that we would be a people that sees your love for us and reflects it in our love for one another. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.